Welcome to the University of New South Wales Canberra Australian Naval History podcast series produced in partnership with the Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society, Navy's Sea Power Centre and the Submarine Institute which has generously supported this particular program. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy this podcast and return for others in the series. I'm Professor Tom Frame, a former Naval Officer and now Director of the Australian Centre for the Study of Armed Conflict and Society at the Defence Force Academy. The centre hosts the very active Naval Studies Group. Please visit our website. To find us, simply Google Naval Studies Group and UNSW Canberra. Ours will be the first website in the search results. This podcast is the first of a three-part series on the RAN Oberon class submarines. And we've given this episode the title, Origins and Introductions. Let me explain. One of Australia's most important and successful naval acquisitions were six Oberon class diesel electric submarines. They were in RAN service from 1967 to 2000. They made a highly significant contribution not only to naval capability, they enlarged the strategic options available to the government. To share something of their introduction, what it was like to serve in an Oberon, and their role in national defence, I'm joined by a group of distinguished submariners who collectively had more than a dozen submarine commands between them. We're particularly privileged to have Vice Admiral Ian McDougall, the first submariner to be the professional head of the Royal Australian Navy. He's on the line from Tasmania. In the studio, we have Terry Roach, Peter Horobin, and David Nichols. Gentlemen, thanks for making the time to speak with us today and being part of what I think is quite an extraordinary panel. So let me come first to you, Peter Horobin. The Australian Navy had three attempts, three attempts to launch a submarine arm prior to the 1960s. Can you tell us a little bit about each of those attempts and how they perhaps might have led to a decision to um, acquire a new submarine arm in the 1960s? Certainly, thanks, Tom. The, the AE-1 and AE-2 were acquired in 1913-14. Indeed, Australia was one of the early entrants to the submarine business. Um, sadly, AE-1 was lost in uh, the Australian fleet uh, operation against the German high seas fleet, or sorry, German Pacific fleet near Rabol. And still not been found. Not been found. Indeed, Peter Briggs, we mentioned earlier, is still looking for it, or leading a team to look for it. A2 uh, was the first Allied submarine to transit the Dardanelles and did so as the Anzacs were landing at Gallipoli in 1915. Sadly, very few Australians even today know that story. A2 was later lost on the 30th of April in the Sea of Marmara and um, the Australian submarine community has been quite energetic in establishing uh, consideration and recognition of A2. Because we know where that boat is, we just can't raise it because it's not our water. Well, um, yes, and, and the maritime archaeologists would tell you not to raise it. Mm. it, would, it it's in reasonable condition at the moment. We lift it out of the water and corrode quite badly. Is there a weapon in there still? Well, there is a missing torpedo. We don't quite know where that is. So Terry, it's best leaving it where it is, yeah, I think. Terry is there. much better informed in AE2 than I am. Um, the J-class submarines were acquired in the, in the latter stages of the, of the First World War, and there's a bit of a question of whether that was a nice gift or not. They were not particularly successful um, and had a number of material defects. There were six J-class submarines and uh, one of them still serves as a part of the fittings of the Sandringham Yacht Club um, where there's a, the, the hull is there as part of the um, seawater protection, I suppose. Sea why protection. were they decommissioned? They were just because we didn't need them after the Great War? Uh, uh, the war had finished. Uh, the, the economy was starting to sag. Um, the Navy was was reducing in size. So numbers of sailors, not enough dollars to, or pounds to keep them operating. And they were, they were materially not, not uh, robust ships. They were, they were materially difficult to operate. But we pressed on in, in the 1920, late 1920s, Oxley and the first Oxley and the first Otway were purchased from, from the uh, Royal Navy. Um, I might add that on a number of occasions, the, a, thing will f a constant theme was diesel engines, which 
would break at inopportune times. And Oxley and Otway, uh, in their passage um, to Australia, stopped in Malta and spent basically the, about three months alongside re-engining uh, to make the rest of the journey. Um, what, did, what did we buy those submarines for? Was it fear of the Japanese, the Germans, or all good navies have submarines, we must have some? I think all of the above. I'm, I'm not sure what the specific region for buying Oxy and Otway. We're also very firmly under the guidance of the Royal Navy at that stage. The, the first sea lord sort of coughed and Australia jumped to attention, So, um, or the Australian Navy did. So we were very much guided by, by what the Royal Navy perceived as what a good colonial navy should look like. In the 1950s, there was this talk about having clockwork mice. For those who are our viewers who've never heard this expression, clockwork mice or mouse, what does that mean in the submarine community? Uh, it's in the Australian context, it's steering out of Sydney Harbour and diving and steering south until Wednesday night at 180 feet and then turning around and steering north till Friday lunchtime, allowing the fleet to ping on you. Uh, it's the sincerest form, the most realistic form of masochism I can think of. You, you know, you're the constant target of, uh, of surface ships and aircraft, who, all of whom at uh, about 10 o'clock on Friday mornings tell you that the serial's completed and they all charge off over the horizon at 300 knots if they're in the air or 28 knots if they're on the surface. So I'm picking up that this was not exactly enjoyable work and that it... Uh, not, not our favourite pastime, I don't think. It's certainly not mine. So the clockwork mice, we've, we've, we've cleared away that term, that's good. But what about these tea boats that came to Australia in the 1950s? The, what, what was their role? They were the original clockwork mice. Uh, the, the Royal Navy um, provided four or three or four T-class submarines um, based in Balmoral. They're based actually in, in HMAS Penguin. Um, and they were remarkably good at barbecues. Um, and Remarkably good at barbecues. Now you're going to have to help the viewers with that well, one as that, well. That was, well, that was my prime reason for joining submarines. I, I uh, um, joined a submarine called Tape Air um, as a cadet and discovered that I was the only one with a naval uniform on board this ship. Um, the first lieutenant wore a sarong, which was... <laughs> it was a little casual. <laughs> I'm picking that up from yeah, it. It was a little right. casual. So the idea of pirate rig as the Brits called it, yeah. was, was very trendy. These submarines were, when I say barbecues, there were a lot of Brit families based in, in, in Australia, so they, their social life was with each other, yeah. more so perhaps, you know, as, as any deployed group would be. And they, uh, so Friday afternoon was a barbecue and it seemed to me that the barbecue kept going through till about Monday morning, but that was my observation. And as you know, the, well, I don't know what penguins like now, but penguin used to be a very comfortable environment. Um, and these chaps enjoyed it. That, but the most challenging thing they did was to steer 180 until Wednesday night being pinged on by surface ships. I think the high point of my experience of the fourth submarine squadron was to participate in a... And that's what the British called it, the fourth the, submarine yeah, squadron. Yeah. yeah. We, Tapir came back into Sydney Harbour on Friday morning and at about three o'clock and bottomed in Rose Bay. Now, you probably couldn't do it then, but you sure as hell can't do it now for a whole lot of reasons. But we bottomed in, in Rose Bay and then released the indicator buoy to stimulate a submarine search and rescue exercise. And we listened to the surface fleet charge out of, the, out of Sydney Harbour and go look for us at six o'clock in the morning. And um, <coughs> then when about 10 o'clock, we listened to them coming in a bit confused because they still hadn't found us. And they started to look inside the harbour. And um, it, we completed a full sort of uh, res just simulated rescue and then were treated at Rushcutters Bay as survivors of this submarine. Quite a complex exercise, which the Brits thoroughly enjoyed. Um, so, so that was something different from being a clockwork mice. So, as I hear that, you could almost be excused for some surprise that the Australian government was persuaded to buy submarines in the 1960s. Ian McDougall, what led our government to decide at this point, the 1960s, that uh, a new class of submarine had to be acquired for the RAN? Well, I mean, we, at the end of World War II, in the beginning of the Cold War, 
<coughs> where there had certainly been an appreciation of the effectiveness of in, in submarine warfare. I mean, 70% of Japanese shipping during World War II were sunk by Allied submarines in the Pacific. And of course, there were the horrendous losses in in the Atlantic and, and European waters as well. So ASW, anti-submarine warfare, and submarine warfare was high on the agenda of people thinking. And as has been alluded to already, the Australian and New Zealand <coughs> pardon me, governments um, agreed to pay £15,000 a year to have Royal Navy submarines based in Sydney for anti-submarine warfare training. Um, a rough conversion of £15,000 to um, Australian dollars today is about 500000 which is not much of a dent in the real estate market uh, as, as we all read each day. And so we, we reached a point where we were living off these renter subs on, a, on the cheap. But the Royal Navy decided, or rather the British government decided, that it was withdrawing to the west of Suez and European operations and therefore could no longer sustain the, fourth, the British 4th Submarine Squadron in Sydney. And so if we were to continue anti-submarine warfare training, then it was necessary to do something, and the, the something became the Oberon project, um, which passed through uh, government with commendable speed, and, and the package in, included training for... Australian sailors to become submariners and the first batch was sent in in, the, in 1963 bearing in mind that the first Oberon for Australia to be built at Scott Shipyard in, on the Clyde was to be delivered in 1967 so it was a short time frame to train up four, the six submarines, about 300 young submariners. But uh, we, we, the Navy set about it with a will, and uh, uh, the Navy uh, took delivery of each of six submarines, although they were in two batches, four followed by two, on time and on budget. And with successful workups with the Royal Navy Authority tasked with assessing the competence of submarines to um, proceed on patrol. So it was driven by the, 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 uh, Royal, the British government uh, deciding to pull out of the Pacific, in effect, and the need for us to do something to replace it. I guess later on in the discussion we might come to the, the point of was ASW training the only thing in, in the minds of the Navy and certainly in the minds of the submariners who, Australian submariners who had been crewing in Royal Navy submarines and in the passing this was manna from heaven for the Royal Navy because they were streaming off their submariners into their nuclear program. <coughs> and our Australian sailors filled the gaps. So there was certainly benefit for them too. But what made, Does that answer what the made, question? But what made you want to become a submariner? What was the appeal? Was it you could see, here's a new capability, it's going to need leaders, I can do this? Was it because it was not in general service in the fleet? Was there a sense of adventure? Uh, was there internal recruiting that attracted you? What was it that led you into the submarine squadron? All, all of the above, but a bit, a bit like Peter Hogan, as a, a child I had played in the wreck <coughs> 
of a Dutch submarine which was on the shore at uh, Fairlight, a, a beachside suburb in Sydney. And it was a rusting hulk, but it was tremendous fun for those of us who managed to find our way into it and, and fiddle with things. And then um, later, I spent a day in one of the uh, British Force Submarine Squadrons called Telemachus, and what struck me as unusual was there was water pouring down the um, attack periscope, and I turned to one of the um, you know, officers and said, this, we were only at periscope depth. And I said, is, is that normal? And he said, yeah, yes, I'm afraid it is. And I thought, well, you know, there's, there's obviously a, a survival component to this, and therefore this would be, later I thought this would be quite a good adventure. And I, I, were, you, were you thinking there would be danger money? <laughs> no, 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 that didn't. <laughs> 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 That's a very mercenary approach, can be. Um, no, 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 not at all. And, and I think I'm right in saying that there was no additional pay for, for submariners at the outset that came later. And Terry Roach, tell us about the Oberots. Uh, the British had been building submarines since 1900. There'd been new classes appearing all the time. What made the Oberons different, special, unique, or an advance on what had come before them? Well, the Brits had learned uh, lots of lessons from uh, World War II, uh, and the, these were incorporated into the design of the, the immediate predecessors, the Porpoise class, the Porpoise class, and then the Oberons for a further development uh, of them. The major characteristics were extremely long range, uh, very quiet, and very capable. They had a, uh, a the contemporary weapon system was uh, good with the weapons of the time became dated uh, as we will discuss in the subsequent uh, But were they program. dated? Were they getting dated quickly when they, they entered service? No, they weren't because they were designed to cope with the uh, contemporary enemy which was the large submarine force of even more primitive submarines in the Soviet uh, Union. Union. Mm. Uh, one of the weapons that the uh, uh, Australia bought was the Mark 23, and the frequency at which it could listen uh, was beyond, would only be made by a target which was too noisy. It's going too fast for it to catch. So it wasn't a great, uh, a, a very successful weapon. But the characteristics that the Oberon have reflected the characteristics that we needed for the task that we had set. Previously, we've been talking. Uh, about the submarines as being clockwork mice, providing training services for the fleet. But in fact, the original decision to buy the Oberon class was not, whilst it was prompted by the British decision to withdraw their uh, T and A classes uh, from uh, Australia, but it was a recognition that there is a, a long range task to be performed out here in Australia. So the catalyst may have been the withdrawal of the RN submarines but the justification for it was the long-range tasking that we still have today. So at the time, it was deemed to be a good decision and the right boat for us to buy? Without question. And Ian McDougall, you had the privilege of commanding both an RN submarine and an RAN submarine. Can you tell us a little bit about the things that you noticed that were different in both that British submarine and the Australian one you subsequently commanded? <coughs> Yes, in a light-hearted vein, um, we insisted on having showers built into our Oberons, and there were not showers in the British Oberons. Um, and one curiosity was, I mean, these were both the same class of submarine, they're both um, the same number of people, and the environment was pretty much the same. And commanding officers of submarines would keep a log of the off-the-shelf um, medication that the troops would need for headaches, uh, colds, coughs, all that sort of stuff. 
And I was surprised that the consumption rate in my Australian submarine was double that of the, um, the RN submarine that I commanded. And the tempo of operations was was at a, at a much higher level. As a, we were in the, the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation order of battle, and so we all knew where to go if if, if the if coal turned into hot, and we did a lot of training in that sense. Some clockwork mousing, but but it was a, a much busier um, environment. I mean, the, I think the at that time the the Royal Navy was less risk averse than we were because not long earlier we had the terrible experience of the Voyager tragedy and. The Royal Navy had not had a, um, a, a similarly serious event, and so their their notion was to train in peace the way you intend to fight in war. And Did the loss of a fray we make much of a difference? Pardon? Did the loss of a fray, the submarine a fray, make much of a difference to? No, not really. No, they had that the. the the, uh, events like that. And of course, the USN had, had some tragedies too, with the loss of Thresher, etc. But they, that did not seem to affect the, the philosophy that you, you train hard and take things to fine limits. And so we did. And I think that also contributed to the, to the fact that, yes, we had always to operate as, as safely. But when we had our overruns back in Australia, that we it sort of added an impetus to the notion that there was much more that these submarines could do uh, than what we had experienced with, through no fault of their own, the, the, the submarines of the Royal Navy's Fourth Squadron based in Sydney before we had the overruns. And Peter Horriman, you had the standby submarine being built in Scotland. What did you do to keep busy? What did you observe? And did you feel you were ready to take the boat both to sea and to Australia when it was delivered to you? I was quite fortunate because I was one of the more junior officers. And so I only joined the boat uh, indeed about two months before it was commissioned. So the issue of what do I do while I'm waiting for this to happen was not a big issue. It was a case of where are my charts and have I planned my passage and am I ready for the workup? So it was quite professionally focused. Uh, I'd had two years in a Brit submarine, an Oberon submarine based in Faslane, which, which as Ian's just described, the operational tempo was much more serious, uh, much more vigorous. The, they're quite happy to devolve responsibility down, which, which in my subsequent naval experience, I think the RN does, or did anyway, much, much better than the RAN. Um, so I found myself with an awful lot of responsibility, probably to be silly, to be realistic, too much responsibility for my experience. How old were you when you were doing this? 23. Um, I, I'd been, I wasn't qualified as a submariner and I put a submarine into dock for a docking period. Now. My commanding officer explained to me afterwards that I shouldn't have done that, but but uh, somebody told me to do it, so I did it. Um, I had the uncomfortable experience of going into a floating dock, and and I shouted across to the dock master saying, "Does this look all right to you?" And he said, "I've never done it before, so uh, that worried me quite a lot." And so I, the chief TIF, the chief ERA was on board the boat, so I asked him up to come up to the bridge because working on the theory, he'd been in submarines for a thousand years, he must know what it looks like. And he looked over the top of the fin and said, is that what it looks like? So, <laughs> <laughs> so at this stage I decided that uh, we'll haul taut, double up and belay and start pumping out the dock, we must be in the right place. So, so the Brits were very happy to give you a lot of responsibility early and let you hang yourself if you like. 
Um, the RAN in my time did never never did that. Um, as a junior officer standing by uh, Otway, um, we uh, we had uh, an officer who was born 300 years too late as our commanding officer. Um, he was a transfer from the RAN and uh, probably was given to us probably with with some glee by the Royal Navy. Um, but I thoroughly enjoyed his company. Um, and he went around defending Captain's SM left, right and centre and we conducted our work up to his entire satisfaction um, and then sailed down the west coast of Africa and back to Australia. David Nichols, do you think that Australians were, if you like, treated more for their reputation than the reality of the people that were actually met? Um, that's a good question. So I spent my first 10 years in the Royal Navy and, and submarines and I met all these wonderful Australians who could play sport and kick the arse of any of the RNs and drink like fish and get into trouble. And I thought, Christ, a nice, real good bunch of blokes these are. And then I got the chance to come to Australia in HMS Odin. And I should explain that uh, the interim between the first four Oberons and the last two, the Royal Navy lent HMS Odin to the squadron as a, as a gap filler, which was a, um, a very interesting experience. And you know, I learned to love Australia very quickly, hence my, well, I've been here longer than I was ever over there now, but uh, that's another story. Um, I think what Peter said about the uh, responsibility that the RN gave people was true, and it did lead to some difficult situations, um, uh, which you may or may not always hear about. Uh, I, th I think the, uh, the Royal Australian Navy was m more conservative, but it really is, it's a bit like what teacher teaches you when you pass Perisher. It, it Perisher teach, being, tell us, you better sorry, tell us about Perisher. Perisher is the commanding officer's course. Right. Um, uh, and it's done in England, well in our days it was done in England. And the, the, uh, there's a misconception that teacher teaches you how to drive a submarine, that's not true. You wouldn't have got on the course if you didn't know how to drive a submarine. What teacher teaches you is your limitations taken into account the material state of the submarine, the, the training state of the crew, uh, and of course you, you do have limitations and, and you put those together and say, well, I'm prepared to go this far. So you give responsibility to people based on that s the sort of things that teacher teaches you. And if you've got some, a good crew and people who are experienced, you'll let them do more than if you've got a crew that are not so well trained. So that's the sort of responsibility uh, that a commanding officer has in terms of executing his command at sea. But Australians weren't more or less um, considered better or poorer than their English counterparts? We had to pass exactly the same page with exactly the same uh, observations from teacher. The guys that went to UK early and did their training over there and did their uh, part threes, which is the practical qualification course for all submariners, and they did a lot of it on RN submarines, were exactly the same positions as, uh, as their RN counterparts. So there was no, in my view, differentiation. But the, you know, the natural characters Australians, uh, uh, being away from home and, you know, being larrikins, a lot of them, being outgoing and bloody good at sport. You'd find that, uh, you know, all the sports teams in the submarine army in, in the UK would have heaps of Australians in them because they were good. And Ian McDougall, when A1 and A2 came to Australia, it was a great feat just to get the submarines to Australia. Were there any noteworthy incidents in the Oberons being delivered to Australia? Because times had changed, the boats were more reliable, but it was still a very long way to come. It was, and, and there wasn't a, a repeat of the, the difficulties of getting earlier classes of submarine from Britain to Australia. I mean, m minor issues which involved you know, getting spares to, to each of the ports of call. There's a lot of myth about the activities of submarines on their way home from the United Kingdom. I can only speak from personal experience of the first, which was Oxley, where <coughs> briefly, en route from Portsmouth to Bermuda, we had an outbreak of what seemed to be um, mumps. We didn't have a doctor or um, any, any qualified medical personnel. So a signal they had to the, the resident naval officer, that is the Royal Navy, in Bermuda saying have I had the following symptoms uh, request advice and the advice was give the patients 
the juice of a fresh lime if mumps um, symptoms will be aggravated. Um, fresh uh, lime trees growing in submarines, mm, not the norm. And did one really want to aggravate the symptoms? So we, we left the mumps patients in Bermuda and went on to Jamaica, where um, many of the, the troops thought that uh, mopeds were a lot of fun, but unfortunately they didn't run truly on alcohol. <laughs> so there were quite a few injuries. We left a batch of them in Jamaica and on to Panama. And by the time we got to Honolulu, we had to have a bit of a head count to see if we had enough people to get back to Brisbane, our first port, arrival port in, in Australia. And fortunately, the, the mumps patients turned up and, and some of the um, moped injuries, and we did have enough. But there was a lot of mythology, too, about others, um, other over and, uh, I'll use the word, antics en route. I would have thought, though, that mumps and mopeds would be enough to go on with as far as anecdotes are concerned. Um, Terry Roach, can I ask you, most people have seen World War II movies of submarines and life on board looks pretty tough. Uh, there were a lot of things about the Oberons which were probably inspired by World War II boats. What were they like in terms of living conditions, both for officers and for sailors? In broad terms, they were considerably better, but still pretty primitive. Perhaps the biggest advance was that there was enough bunks for everybody and that people normally didn't have to hot bunk. That is to share on a sequential basis the use of a, a particular bunk. Uh, the, during the uh, delivery voyages, there was uh, uh, a full uh, a load of weapons which would restrict the number of additional emergency accommodation which could be taken up in the uh, torpedo storage compartment. Uh, the RAN Oberons had a better air conditioning capacity, a greater fresh water capacity uh, than the, uh, the earlier British uh, Oberons. And by comparison with the, uh, the, uh, the RNA boats and T boats, they were more, more comfortable than they were. Did you have sailors, though, come on board and say, I'd like to be a submariner, and two days later they say, oh, I just can't cope with these conditions? Uh, was there a kind of rigorous screening process to find out that, look, people really weren't suitable for the, if you like, the habitability of the boat before they became submariners? There was a screening process. And during, at that time, all of our uh, submariners are volunteers. And I believe that's still the case, that all the submariners are volunteers. If somebody really doesn't want to be there, you accept that and tell them, uh, because they have to have an acceptance of the rigors of life on board and the self-discipline to be able to adapt to those rigors and to, uh, to live, live them. If they can't do that, then they're no good to you or them, themselves. So in my personal experience, I only ever came across one individual that said he really couldn't, didn't want to be there. And so we waved him goodbye without any uh, qualms in either direction. And what was the longest period of time that people would either spend dived or away from a harbour? Uh, well, in some of the patrols, and one I did in particular, was around about uh, 47 days from one port to the, to the next, of which 45 of those were dived. Uh, that's probably typical of most of the experiences of the, of the officers and sailors that, that are here. Uh, it sounds like it's a long, and it is a long time, but in fact, the routine and the demands of work are such that your time is fully occupied, and you have the uh, the uh, uh, intervals of uh, at that time the, uh, the sixteen millimeter uh, movies and watching somebody trying to get the machine to work uh, sati satisfactorily. Uh, those delights are now past this present generation. They've got them all on uh, videos on. But people must have been, I mean, they were physically close, but after, I would imagine, 40 odd days down, um, people would become either close friends or you'd have real ruptures in the relationships running the boat. No, because 
it was, I'm sure it did occur. I never saw any manifestation in terms of uh, physical uh, fights. But the character and the demeanour of the people that were selected were such that they were able to adapt to, they learned to live with each other. There was no alternative to learning to live uh, with, with each other. And did they feel they were part of a tradition? Because when the Australian Navy got submarines, it was just doing it for the first time. Nobody that had served in those previous boats were in the Oberon. Did it take long for people to feel we're part of a tradition or were they establishing a new tradition? They felt they were establishing a new tradition and they wanted to set... Uh, uh, setting standards is not the right, not the, the, the right word. They want to uh, uh, adopt the... Uh, the customs and practices that were a very professional and uh, very safe. I mean the two things go together and you could only do that if you had a, uh, an acceptance of the self-discipline needed to operate the, the perform their job, operate the submarine uh, safely and successfully and to have the mental stability to be able to deal with the personal relationships that of the rest of the crew. And David Nichols you come from England and you joined the Australian Navy and submarines were based at HMAS Platypus in Neutral Bay, one of the most lovely cities in the world. Did you think um, the base was there because it was a nice place to be or because it made strategic sense? I think it's, uh, I think from what I'm uh, advised, the RNT boat squadron, the fourth submarine squadron, whilst it was based at, uh, around at Penguin, if the weather blew up and it got uncomfortable at Penguin, they, they would come round to Neutral Bay. Um, now there was a, a gas works at Neutral Bay before the submarine base, and I suspect that the wharf was there for uh, the coal uh, supplies for the for the gas station. So I suspect Neutral Bay's had a wharf there for many years. Um, but was it was a strategic, good place to have a submarine base. Oh, sure. Oh, well, apart there was a few problems with parking and that sort of thing. But I mean, you were very central, and uh, uh, you know, it's. Uh, it was strategically, um, in terms of being in Sydney, and easy access to the fleet uh, operating areas. Would have been uh, better if you'd been at Garden Island at the main, at the main facility. I think putting the submariners in a separate area so that they could concentrate on the training and the support uh, of submarines in uh, in isolation is probably the best thing to do. If, I would suspect that if they'd put them over at Garden Island, that there would have been a competition for resources, war space, uh, and I think the decision to build it at uh, Platypus and Neutral Bay was a wise one. So let me come back to the point Terry Roach made just a few moments ago, that the Australians felt they were establishing a new tradition. You'd experienced the Royal Navy tradition. What sort of differences did you notice in the culture of Australian submariners and the ethos they were developing and that which you'd experienced before? Uh, there, weren't as, there weren't as many chips on the menu. <laughs> for a start. <laughs> um, in, the, in the early days, uh, most of the Australian submariners had trained in England, so they had, they brought with them that some continuity. Some continuity uh, we, we referred to earlier in, I think, the discussion of the use of pirate rig. Well, pirate rig was de rigueur, for want of a better word, uh, at sea. Um, we, di we didn't expect everybody to wear uniform every day. Uh, so you become, the esprit de corps sort of becomes an all of one, all of one team. Um, and I don't really think that the Australian submariners developed uh, any different characteristics to uh, other submariners. Submariners around the world are very similar. I mean, they, they have the same sort of issues to deal with in terms of operating in a very harsh environment. Um, they work very hard and they play very hard. Uh, and those are the sort of characteristics that, that to my recollection anyway, and I'm quite sure, um, well I hope it's the same today, that, that, uh, that the submarine force enjoys just as much as we do. And there's no sense of resentment that you'd come from another country to the Australian Navy. Oh, like, I got a bit of ribbing. <laughs> that's, that's but just what you'd expect of anyone yeah, in any profession I, coming I, to and Australia. And the fact was I was a ready trained uh, officer with, uh, you know, with, a, with a, a wish to live in this lovely country and bring my children up in it, and I made a lot of friends very quickly. Um, I, for me, it was almost a seamless transfer, uh, and I, within a couple of years, I'd gone, went back to doing my commanding officers course at Perisher. Uh, Peter Horriban, what kind of operations, though, were submarines doing in the period, to say the late 70s? The Cold War is underway. There's uh, 
tumultuous conflicts in parts of Southeast Asia, but we don't hear about submarines playing an active role in, say, Vietnam or the Indonesian confrontation with Malaysia, but the Cold War is going on. What kinds of operations were you doing and were they the kind of operations that you could say much about given their nature? During the 70s, um, I, think, I think the world saw the Cold War got quite warm towards the latter end of the 70s and 80s before it stopped. Um, my, my impression, uh, therefore, was that you, the UK was very focused on, on our, um, operations and that was influencing our thinking, as we've all talked about. Then um, uh, the Australians were still operating in this sort of ASW training mode, and that was quite frustrating, for, I think, for most of the submariners. Then um, the sort of Orion and Atama arrived, and, and the nature of our operations started to become a lot more professional. So covert surveillance? That, well, ISR role is, is, is the term they used at the time. Um, the Soviets actually helped us at this stage. Um, if you, the, the, there was quite a lot of activity in the Middle East and the, and the United States was, was deploying carrier groups to, to the Middle East and we were deploying our carrier to join them. And it, it appeared to me, and I think you were on board at the time, that in fact the Soviets were using the workup of Melbourne as a training run to, to work out what the American carrier operations were going to be so they could actually get inside the carrier ring. So as you know, we had company for mm -hmm. Melbourne's workup during 1980. We explained that to the fleet commander on several occasions and got told that we were talking rubbish and then we gave them the tapes. So the, it was happening around us. And then uh, I think people, the general trend, the whole of Australia started to think differently, but the submarine community then started to conduct proper ISR operations uh, f further afield. So it wasn't boring and it wasn't inactive, but it wasn't a whole lot of stuff that people could see and perhaps appreciate as they might say with surface operations. It wasn't boring, it was very, very interesting. Um, but it, but it was, was not something that you could then roll into the pub and Talk tell your mates it. about. Yeah. Well, you shouldn't have, yeah. And Terry Roach, the the decision was made early to establish the submarine command team trainer or SCAD at Watson's Bay in Sydney. What was its purpose and where did you find people to staff it? The, SAT, the SCAT was uh, uh, set up to so that the submariners could take advantage of the introduction of the simulation training. Both the submarine world and the aviation world have been early adopters of the simulation technology. Uh, the SCAT was a precursor of the digital trainers that there are now. It was an analog uh, trainer. But it means that we could do uh, practice a lot of the procedures and, uh, and tactics in the environment of a trainer ashore without having the expense and the difficulty and dangers of operating a submarine sea. Indeed, there are some things you can do in the trainers which were too dangerous to do at sea. So you could learn safety operations, particularly in respect of uh, operations in close proximity to uh, surface uh, targets, surface uh, ships. Uh, it provided a, uh, uh, a base for training not only uh, individual operators, but also a basis for training command teams. And indeed, it provided a, a base to help prepare our candidates for the submarine uh, command qualification course that David was uh, as mentioned uh, perishing. Yeah. yeah, and in that respect, it was a great success. It also provided us with a base from which to expand when we needed. We that we recognised there was a need to integrate the weapons and sensors to be acquired under the submarine weapons update uh, program, and so it provided a. Uh, uh, a good uh, starting point. Ian McDougall was the initial uh, officer in charge and I succeeded him. Uh, yeah. Well, we might finish Ian McDougall with you. If he could just look back on the first 
10 years of Oberon operations, 1967 through to say 77. What would you describe as the main contributions of the Oberons to the Navy in the first instance and the nation in the second? In terms of, of the nation, um, there, there was a, a growing awareness at the political level that this was a strategic weapon and useful for countering those who might have interests inimical to ours. In terms of the Navy, when, when we sort of, the General Navy, you're remembering that 97.5% of the Navy served, were serving not in submarines, that after the initial shock, and it, it was recognised that submarines were an essential part for, of um, maritime warfare for Australia and, and its interests, I mean, extending to trade routes, etc., et is that you know, it settled down from an, an early um, errors on both sides of, of, of the house, I think, and not least because there was a new competitor in the game for resources, and some of the resources were pretty expensive. Um, and by the end of the period that you specified, I, I think things had settled down well, and there was a, a recognition of, at the political level of this was a very potentially a very valuable tool, not just for training in, for submarine, uh, anti-submarine warfare, but for other purposes. It's worth pointing out, I think, in terms of the Cold War, that we all know that 70% of the Earth's surface is is water, and 40% of the of the, of the uh, Earth's surface is international waters, whilst land forces during the Cold War were somewhat bound by territorial boundaries on land. Once you get into international waters, there are no boundaries, and so some of the interaction, the actions that occurred a long way from everybody's home, i.e. deep into international waters, was pretty serious proposition. I mean, one mistake could trigger dire consequences for for uh, the Cold War, in the worst case, turning hot. So uh, submarines became, um, in, in consciousness, a, a very serious proposition. Ian McDougall, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for a conversation that's ranged from the national interest to personal leisure. I think we've learned a whole lot about barbecues and submarine culture. Uh, and I do hope those who are watching this podcast have appreciated this insight, rare insight, from those who have been in submarines and associated with them for more than half a century. So my thanks to Ian McDougall, Peter Horriban, David Nichols, and Terry Roach, and thank you for joining us. That's all for now. We look forward to your company next time. Goodbye.